Hello. This video is the third in a three-part series about ethics. In this video, I'll be talking about the ethics uh, content covered in chapter six of Bit by Bit. In parts one and two, I've covered the material that's in Bit by Bit. In this third video, I'll discuss some additions and extensions. This is material that I thought could be elaborated on further. And this is material that's come out since Bit by Bit has been published. So in the first two parts of this video series about ethics or in chapter six of Bit by Bit, you learned about these topics. If you haven't read Bit by Bit chapter six and or watched these first two videos, you should stop now and watch those first. So what I want to do now is move on to the additions and extensions. So the first of five addition and extensions that I want to talk about is in the area of respect for law and public interest. So as you remember, I argued that there are four principles <clears throat> that we can use to guide our thinking about research ethics. The fourth comes from the Menlo Report and it's respect for law and public interest. And so one area where this comes up particularly a lot in computational social science is terms of service agreements. So these are the agreements that you click, I agree, uh, when you're accessing a lot of online services um, <clears throat> that provide a set of rules that um, govern your uh, access of those online services. So these terms of service agreements, um, one challenge is that some of the time what people wanna do as researchers actually appears to be in conflict with what's in the terms of service agreements. Or other times it's not clear from the terms of service agreements whether the research would be permissible or not under the terms of service agreement. So many researchers have to decide what to do if, if their research violates the terms of service or is ambiguous with the terms of service. And so I want to talk about a paper that I think does a really good job of dealing with this issue. This is a paper by Solar et al. called MapWatch. And what they were interested in doing was they were interested in understanding online maps. So they started out with the idea that maps are really important for how people see the world. And maps also embed within them a lot of choices of the map creator. And so they were interested in whether companies like Google and Microsoft in their map platforms were in maybe um, embedding certain information about the world, perhaps pressured by governments to make maps look different in one country than in another country. This could come up particularly in areas where there are different names for the same area or there are contested borders. So they wanted to understand how much map personalization was happening. So to do this, they created the system called MapWatch they used an API to trigger requests for map tiles from these two mapping platforms, uh, the one Microsoft Bing and Google Maps. And then they took these tiles and sent them to crowd workers and had them try to uh, annotate them to see if there were differences depending on where the um, user was looking at the map. So here's an example of one of the things that they found. So these are um, maps around the Crimea. So if you were using, um, this is for Google Maps. So if you were looking at Google Maps from within Russia, what you would see is a map with a border between Crimea and the Ukraine. If you were looking from Ukraine, that's the middle of the three maps, you would not see a border, which seems to indicate that Crimea is part of the Ukraine. And if you were looking from anywhere other than Crimea, I mean, anywhere other than Russia or Ukraine, you would see the third map on the right, which shows um, that there is a, a dotted line, which indicates that there's a contested border. So this is an example of the kind of thing that they were able to find with their MapWatch system. So it turned out that the, this project was not consistent with the terms of service of either of these systems, and they wrote about this in the paper. So I wanna read this ethics statement, which was part of the paper. Many web, web platforms discourage automated crawling outside the API. Even within the API, uh, a platform may prohibit research on its terms of service, usually for competitive reasons. We agree with 57, that's a different paper, that non-commercial research for the public good that deals with issues of societal importance must be able to access public web resources for research purposes, as long as the automated processes do not produce an unreasonable load. This was our guiding philosophy in this research design. So what they said is we realized that this may not be consistent with the terms of service, but we're going to do it anyway for these reasons. 
And we're also going to take precautions to try to make sure that we don't impose an unreasonable load on these services. And I think that's a very important thing. When researchers are uh, accessing APIs or, or doing web scraping, I think it's very important to be considerate to the platform provider. We don't want to be causing problems for them in the way in, as a part of our research efforts. So as you think about your own research, and if you are thinking about whether you should do something that violates a terms of service or is ambiguous with the terms of service, you should think to yourself, would I be willing to put an ethics statement like this in my paper? Is my justification for, for potentially violating the terms of service as strong as this? So I wanna point out also that there is a, a big legal debate about whether these terms of services are actually legally binding. So I'm not a lawyer, but uh, Kristen Sandvig, who's one of the authors of the MapWatch paper, uh, ha has filed a lawsuit um, against the U.S. federal government trying to ensure that researchers are not uh, bound by these terms of service agreements under the con con uh, Computer Fraud Access Act, uh, CFAA. Um, so you can read more about that case by clicking on the link here. So. Whether it's illegal or not, there's a question that many researchers face about whether they should violate the terms of service or not. And so if you're thinking about doing it, I would highly recommend watching the talk that Dean Freelon gave at 6 2018 called Surviving the Post-API Age. And so the argument that he makes in this talk is that um, APIs are getting shut down and so increasingly researchers who want access to data from web platforms are forced to do scraping and other techniques that he calls going off the grid. And so if you are thinking of going off the grid, here are some things to think about. So if you go off the grid, you might end up losing access to your data during your research. So if you start a months long project that involves scraping and then the company figures out that you're scraping and prevents you from scraping, you will potentially be cut off from data access for the rest of your research. You might also struggle to have your research funded. You might struggle to talk about your research and you might struggle to, to publish it. So for example, I've reviewed a grant that involved a researcher proposing to go off the grid and collect some data through scraping that violated the terms of service. And the particular funder um, that that was considering the grant was very concerned about this and ended up eventually not funding the research because they did not want to support research that goes off the grid. But even if you cross that barrier, um, you may run into problems as you start presenting your research to other people and they start asking you about your decisions. Or if you submit your paper for public uh, publication, it might come up in the peer review process. Finally, uh, if you go off the grid, uh, and you manage to get through all these other hurdles, you might not then be able to share your data with other researchers. So there's a growing movement toward open and reproducible research. And if your data is acquired through, uh, let's say gray means, then you may not be able to share your data with others, which could lead to other problems in the future. And if you go off the grid and cause problems, it may make it harder for other academics in the future who try to access APIs. So all of this is to say that although some research, like the MapWatch research, does uh, explicitly violate terms of service, um, there are real risks to what Dean Frillon calls going off the grid. And so if this is something that you're thinking about, I would urge you to consider it carefully and talk to some other people, talk to your colleagues and see what they think about how you should approach this issue. Okay, so the second area of uh, addition and extension I wanna talk about is informational risk. So as you remember, I talked about four areas of difficulty um, when applying the ethical principles in computational social science. One is informational risk. This is the risk that comes to people if information about them is made public. And so we started with this simple idea that data can be made anonymous and we can tell what data are sensitive. And I tried to build up this other idea, which is that all data are potentially identifiable and all data are potentially sensitive. So I've seen many social scientists struggle with this idea that all data are potentially identifiable. And so in the, in, in the previous lecture and in Bit by Bit, I showed you this example from Latanya Sweeney's research where she took the identified medical data, she took voter registration data, and then merged them together to re-identify the medical data. And 
Um, not all re-identification attacks happen in exactly this form. So I want to give you another example of a well-meaning um, researcher who tried to make data available um, and then it was later re-identified. So this is the AOL search log example. So AOL, uh, short for America Online, they used to run a search engine and researchers there wanted to make search queries available to other researchers. With the idea being that these queries could be help um, stimulate better ways of doing search and support other kinds of research. So they released a bunch of search queries. They removed things like IP addresses, but from the sequence of queries, it became possible to re-identify people. So let's look at the searches from user 4417749. First, there's a search for numb fingers, 60 single men, dogs that urinate on everything, landscapers in Lilburn, Georgia, several people with the last name Arnold, home sold in Shadow Lake subdivision, Gwinnett County, Georgia. And so just based on these search queries, uh, reporters went to Shadow Lake subdivision, Gwinnett County, Georgia, and were able to locate person 4417749. Her name is Thelma Arnold. And so this is another example where the researchers at AOL, they had only good intentions when they released the data, and they just did not realize that the data could be used and re-identified in this way. And so in general, it's very, very, very hard to know what kind of re-identification is possible because you don't know what kind of outside information an adversary might have uh, that they would combine with the data that you've released. So additional area of uh, addition and extension three is a fifth area of difficulty that I've seen come up more since Bit by Bit was published. So again, I talked about four areas of difficulty and the fifth area of difficulty is what I would call unanticipated secondary uses. So these are situations where research or data is used in a way that it was never intended and often this unintended secondary use can actually be quite detrimental. So let me give you an example from the project eBird. So eBird is a wonderful mass collaboration uh, designed by ornithologists to help study birds. So the way eBird works is there are volunteers who go out and look at birds and record what the birds that they see and upload them to the central database. And this large scale citizen science collaboration produces an enormous database about bird locations all over the world. It's a very important resource for ornithologists. Um, so as far as I know, everyone who worked on eBird loves birds. They, they created this project with only the best of intentions However, it's recently become clear that, as this article said, plants and birds need privacy online too. So what's happening is that some people with bad intentions like poachers are using the data from eBird to go out and hunt endangered species. So now eBird has had to add in a level of protection for certain sensitive species. The data is now no longer available. And so what we see is researchers with nothing but the best of intentions have created something that's inadvertently used for a bad purpose. And I think increasingly we as researchers need to think about how the tools and systems we develop uh, can be used by other people who maybe don't have the same intentions that we do. So an area where I see this research being particularly, this concern being particularly pressing is there are a number of people who do research about um, inferring mental health from digital trace data. So as far as I know, all of these researchers have very good intentions, and you can imagine how this um, research and tools can be used for good, and you can also imagine how there are some unanticipated secondary uses that would be actually quite bad. And so as researchers, we're going to have to get a little bit more advanced in terms of thinking about what are some of these unanticipated secondary uses and how do we mitigate them. And so one way that I like to do this is I think about uh, Lex Luthor. So for those of you who are not Superman fans, Lex Luthor is an evil supervillain. He's very powerful and he's very evil. And so what I like to do is think about how would Lex Luthor use this? And so if you think about eBird, if those researchers have thought, how would Lex Luthor use the eBird data? They might have imagined this problem with sensitive species. And so this is an example of what computer security researchers call adversarial thinking. It's involved in thinking about how someone would attack or misuse what you're creating. And I think 
building more adversarial thinking into computational social science is an important thing that we can do to help anticipate and potentially mitigate some unanticipated secondary uses. A fourth area of addition and extension I'd like to talk about is the practical tips. So I've talked about three practical tips previously, and I want to add a fourth, which is think of ethics as a research opportunity. That is, I've noticed that some, some researchers think about ethics as a burden and they say, oh, I have to do all this ethics stuff. It's taking so much time and energy. But I think increasingly ethics will be an area of research opportunity. That is to say, as just as we develop new statistical estimators that have different properties, so we want to develop methods that are more accurate, cheaper, faster, better in certain conditions, I think increasingly ethical balance will be a way that new methods can be uh, evaluated and used for innovation. So I think there's a big opportunity in creating more ethically responsible methods. So differential privacy is an example of this, this is an area of computer science where the goal is to allow um, safe uh, data access in a way that is privacy preserving. And this turns out to be a huge area of research that creates lots of interesting uh, and important research questions. So research ethics is really, I think, an area of opportunity. Um, just to give an example, there's this uh, ACM conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency. It used to be called Fat Star, and now I think it's called Fact. And so this conference, again, um, is a place where people who are doing research specifically about ethics can publish their research. So the final uh, addition and extension I want to add is building on this idea of thinking of ethics as a research opportunity. And I want to give you a little case study from my own work. So this is a project I did with Ian Lundberg, Arvind Narayanan, and Karen Levy. Um, it's a project about how we manage data access in the Fragile Families Challenge, which was a scientific mass collaboration that we worked on. And so in this case, we wanted to make data available to other researchers, but we were concerned about the kinds of re-identification attacks that I've described earlier, and we were concerned about other things as well. And so rather than thinking of this ethical responsibility as a burden, we thought about it as a chance to do research. That is, how can we develop procedures and processes and techniques that help us um, ensure data access in the, the most responsible way that we can? And so here's the abstract of the paper, and it, it highlights a fundamental tension that many research data stewards have. So if you have some data, you want to make it available to as many people as possible to ensure that as much as possible is learned from it. On the other hand, you want to keep that data as private as possible so that to protect the people who are in the data. So this tension underlies all uh, data about people, and we address that um, common tension in this uncommon setting of the Fragile Families Challenge. So this paper describes the processes that we went through, and we try to be open about the trade-offs that we made so that others can improve on what we've done in the future. So here we thought of this as an opportunity for us to solve a hard research problem and publish a paper about it to contribute to the academic literature. So again, chapter six of Bit by Bit and the first two videos uh, about ethics have covered the topics listed here. Then in this video, additions and extensions, I provided five areas where I wanted to expand on what was in the other materials. And that is all. Thank you.